afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our Medical Center Hour today. This is the first Medical Center Hour of the spring semester of 2010. And I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. I'm delighted to welcome you all on this snowy day. Um, our program today is called Reducing Health Disparities, the Role of Cultural and Linguistic Competence. Cultural competence and linguistic competence are part of health professionals and the complex systems they work in, are fundamental aspects of quality care, particularly for diverse patient populations. Such competencies and the respectful patient-provider interactions they make possible are also key to reducing the significant health disparities found in our society. Today's Medical Center Hour looks at how cultural and linguistic competence in health professionals and in the systems they work in can improve patients' access to and utilization of care, enhance the quality and outcomes of the care that they receive, improve the performance of the health professionals, and foster greater patient satisfaction, engagement, and well-being. We've assembled a panel of four speakers whose brief biographical sketches you will find in your handout. Professor of Medicine Preston Reynolds will begin, and she will introduce her fellow panelists. We'll also look forward to your questions and comments once all of our speakers have made their presentations. And I'd also like to thank Preston for her invaluable help in organizing uh, this session and in bringing um, our outside speaker, Tawara Good, uh, here to UVA from Georgetown. So with no further ado, Preston, um, we'll get on with the program. Thank you, Marcia. I'd like to start this program uh, by asking a question. Does our history as a medical profession matter when we talk about the importance of cultural and linguistic competence and implicit bias as strategies to eliminate health disparities? As many in this room may not know, medical care and all health professions training including medicine, nursing, dentistry, <coughs> public health, contributed to the reality of racism in America well into the 1970s, and many would argue into the present. Most nursing schools did not open their doors to minority students until well after World War II, nor did medical and dental schools, except for Howard and Meharry, that were established specifically in the 19th century to train black professionals. Howard also admitted Jews and women. First black medical student admitted to a Southern medical school occurred in 1948 at the University of Arkansas. Duke, one of the last holdouts, admitted its first minority student in 1965. And up until the implementation of the Medicare program in the summer of 1966, nearly every hospital in the country segregated minority patients, including Native Americans, Hispanics, Blacks, and Irish in Boston, into separate wards that often were located in the basement, in dark, hot wings, or in buildings at the back of the main hospital. Simply put, being a minority meant being denied access to hospitals as patients, nurses, students, interns and residents, practicing physicians, and employees, unless you worked in housekeeping, laundry, or the kitchen. In his book, History of Neglect, Healthcare for Blacks and Mill Workers in the 20th Century South, Ed Beardsley <coughs> recounts the story of a white physician from Selma, Alabama, who said to his colleagues at a meeting of the Southern Medical Society in 1914, blacks were, back, black, ba blacks were backward and inefficient, not because they were an inferior people, but because they were a sick people, outrageously sick, pathetically sick. And sick they stayed because of the history of neglect by physicians in the healthcare system in this country for all but the last 30 or 40 years. It is no wonder that Beardsley included in his book these illustrations. 
health disparities are a reality because of the history of discrimination in health care that we still struggle to eliminate. In July 1965, President Lyndon Johnson signed Medicare into law. Within one year after the signing of that legislation, more than 7,000 hospitals would need to be certified as compliant with new racial integration standards developed by the federal government in response to legal action, a Supreme Court decision, and passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that included Title VI. That legislation, Title VI, for the first time enabled the federal government to withhold funding to any program or institution that discriminated on the basis of race, gender, or national origin. John Gardner, as secretary of HEW, assembled a team of experts. Some were carryovers of the Kennedy administration, and all were determined to reverse discrimination in health care health professions education, and hospital employment practices. To assess the extent of the problem, HEW sent surveys to hospitals around the country and found, much to their dismay, that discrimination against minorities was widespread. With only three months to implementation of Medicare, HEW sent over 300 people into the field to site visit hospitals throughout the South and to communicate just how serious the feds were about full compliance. No approval meant no money from Medicare. And for many hospitals, this translated into 25% of their operating expenses that had gone as uncompensated care. For medical schools, it meant non-renewal of all of their research and training grants. The response to the Medicare hospital certification program was predictable. Some hospitals and states were on board eagerly awaiting this kind of change, others were determined to stand firm in their policies of race discrimination. And as you can see, Virginia did not lead the South, but held back with widespread refusal to embrace the new federal standards. Hospital administrators stalled, others balked, others called their congressmen, begging for a way out of change that for many men for the first time, opening their doors to minorities. And these are just a few of, two of the cartoons and one of the comments heard from hospital administrators when speaking to federal site visitors. And you might ask, why do I show cartoons? And I do because they reflect deeper attitudes residing in public and professional consciousness. When I interviewed Sherry Arnstein, who was central to the effort inside HEW to racially integrate hospitals, she admitted they realized they couldn't change physicians' attitudes about race discrimination, but they were determined to change their behaviors. Without doubt, the Medicare hospital certification did change the direction of the Titanic. What would no longer, um, what would take a lot longer than people expected was, however, changing physician attitudes and integrating into the curriculum the teaching of skills that would enable all patients to be treated with dignity, compassion, excellence, and awareness of culture as strategies to eliminate health disparities. I'd now like to turn this over to Ms. Tawara Good. She's director of the National Center for Cultural Competency. In that role for the last 13 years, she has built the center into an internationally recognized program with major federal funding uh, and major foundation funding. Okay. Thank you, President, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I need to just spend some time talking about uh, the role of cultural and linguistic competence in, um, in reducing disparities. Um, may go through slides a little quickly. This is a, a, a model uh, thinking about disparities, and we hear the term racial and ethnic disparities, we hear the term disparities in health and mental health care, and I'd like for us to really um, broaden this, to think that disparities in health care may be different from, and we may look to assess that different than disparities in health. 
And oftentimes people mix those up. And I think it's very important for us to really think about strategies and approaches that address health care, as well as the disparities that we see in health. Um, and as we think about some of the uh, components, one thing is to look at disparities in access. There may be a strate a, a strategic approaches for that. There are also disparities in utilization, and many things may contribute to that. There's disparities in treatment, intervention, and services. So again, looking at these um, in that way. But we also know that health policy and infrastructure and, and resources to allocate it have an impact on that, as well as the social, political, economic, and environmental context in which people live. So that well, as we think about disparities um, in health care and in health, it's quite complex and we need to view many, many factors. And ultimately, this does impact on the overall health and status that we see within uh, individuals, within communities, and populations. So I encourage people as they think about efforts and quote disparities, that begin to segment this and to look at them in very specific areas um, to more um, aptly guide interventions. A term that's been really used recently is health inequities, which is different than health disparities. And health inequities um, really are when, um, that it systematically puts groups of people who are already socially disadvantaged by virtue of their gender, um, perhaps age, um, their, their religion, uh, their race or ethnicity, at further disadvantage with respect to their health. And so again, in terms of conceptualizing and looking at um, how we use terminology and how we view things, inequities is something very important that we need to focus on. And also, there's a very powerful quote from um, Martin Luther King, who speaks to the, all the forms of inequality, injustice and health is the most shocking and most inhumane. And that's because, as we think about ourselves as in health professions, we're there because we want to help people. And it's very difficult to think that a system that's set up to help people could inadvertently harm people, not respect people, um, and actually give disparate care. It's very hard to admit. So we know that cultural and linguistic competence is, um, again, the emergent evidence is showing that, indeed, has an impact on helping to reduce disparities. Um, and I say help to reduce disparities as opposed to that it is the answer for addressing disparities. Because if we look back at that original diagram, there are many, many factors that impact disparities in health and health care in our country. And cultural and linguistic confidence, while very effective, cannot solve all of those issues. So um, in order to uh, share some of the evidence that we have about how effective cultural and linguistic competence will be, we need to at least be on the same page around how we're defining it. Very quickly, I'd like to speak to how we look at cultural competence. Um, it really looks at the capacity of an organization, including um, its values um, and yet principles, to have in place policies and procedures, practices, values and attitudes that will enable a group of, of people to work effectively cross-culturally. And I emphasize that it's cross-culturally, not cross-racially, not cross-ethnically, and that we need to differentiate and define those terms, um, quite frankly. We um, also know that this has to be throughout an organization, from the policy-making level, administrative practice to service level, consumer, family, patient level, and community level. Um, and it needs to be in all aspects of the organization, not relegated to just a practice level. Quickly, in terms of looking at linguistic competence, and um, this is an emerging term that we've seen with the enactment of, of legislation um, and, quite frankly, standards that came under the Department of Health and Human Services. And we're looking at defining linguistic competence as the capacity of an organization and its personnel to be able to convey information in a manner that's easily understood. And again, this would be by a diverse group of individuals. That would include individuals who may or may not speak English. This may include individuals who may or may not be literate, either in English or their language of origin. 
may include individuals who um, have disabilities and therefore have some communication impairments. Lastly, it may include individuals who may be deaf or hard of hearing. We believe that, again, looking at linguistic competence, particularly in healthcare, is that there, it requires provider and organizational capacity to address the health literacy needs of individuals receiving care. And lastly, as this diagram um, shows, there needs to be policies in place, practices, structures, procedures, dedicated fiscal resources, and also dedicated personnel to enable this to happen successfully to help patients, families, and communities. So, that being said, I want to share with you some of the work um, that we've done at Georgetown, looking at the evidence based of cultural and linguistic competence in healthcare, and a soon to be published chapter on the essential role of cultural and linguistic competence in addressing racial and ethnic health disparities within the African American community. We used the model, a um, proposed model, that said if we have in place cultural and linguistic competence as we describe, that we should see improvement in quality and effectiveness of care, health outcomes and well being effective as a patient-provider communication, provider knowledge and skills, patient-provider satisfaction, and mutual respect and shared decision-making. Ultimately, we'd like to see a decrease in um, the significant burden of health disparities, um, disproportionate burden of mortality, system cost, and bias. Today, we'll focus only on um, those areas that will look at improving quality and effectiveness of care. We know from the literature that indeed cultural linguistic competence improves quality of care in the areas that you see listed, and it's fairly well documented. We also know that the presence of cultural competence on uh, policies within practices are an independent predictor of quality of care. The study was done for children who have asthma. It was quite effective in um, the Western um, area of this country. So we know that policy is clearly linked to quality of outcomes. We also know that quality and effectiveness of care are compromised in the absence of the provision of interpreter services um, in healthcare and healthcare settings. So that includes patient safety, adverse events, and medical errors. When we think about, again, um, health outcomes and well-being, when we examine the literature, and this would be the extant literature, is that we saw that cultural competence was indeed effective in linguistic competence in reducing immediate and short-term um, uh, outcomes and improving those. And those are listed there, such as weight loss, improved nutrition, um, reduction in HB, A1C readings, those kinds of things. However, the literature as it exists now does not really show us what the long-term benefits are. And I would say that for a lot of reasons. A, the field is still young and emerging. B, just getting um, support to conduct the long-term um, research such as that um, is often problematic. If we look at the effectiveness of patient and provider communication, we know that there's just, um, uh, I would say, a truckload of literature that documents um, cultural, cross cultural communication. And again, is that being a very essential element of, um, of uh, cultural competence and being able to address the diversity that we have in this country? And so, as we think about effectiveness of patient and provider uh, communication, um, I can give some quick examples. We know that patients who believe that they've been treated unfairly due to their race and who thought they would have received better care had they been of a different race, more likely to ignore doctor's advice and put off care when medically needed. Uh, Cooper and all found that physicians deliver less information, less supportive talk, and less proficient clinical performance to black and Hispanic patients and patients of lower socioeconomic status um, than more advantaged patients. We also know from Johnson and all found that physicians were more verbally dominant and engaged in less patient-centered communication with African American patients than with their white um, than with their white patients. Um, and so, as we look at um, this whole area of patient-provider communication, it really is very key. We also know that those physicians who most likely be sued are those who do not communicate well with their patients. And again, that's when English is the first language. Um, as we think about provider knowledge and skills, um, again, pro provider knowledge and skills are really very key. And this is, again, a review of the literature to list those areas that were thought to be culturally and linguistically uh, competent, and again, key areas of knowledge and skills um, for, for providers. Um, I'll um, allow you to, to look at those overall. We know that, um, again, 
these are really key areas. And as you see, cross-cultural communication is there, knowledge of health beliefs and practices, um, really being able to um, combat and address the isms, because they are present in our society. And oftentimes our skills don't prepare us to be able to address those, whether it's with patients and whether it's with colleagues or others within communities. So again, these are key areas of concern. As we look at the literature on patient provider satisfaction, um, and again, um, there's not um, uh, an abundance of this literature. What we did see is largely the literature folks focused on provider dissatisfaction. Um, and again, their, um, and retention in underserved communities as, list, as listed here. We also found studies um, that, um, that, we also found that most studies did not examine the relationship between cultural competence of the provider and or organization and their retention, which is a key area. And we saw this particularly in the National Health Service for people are going to a variety of areas that may not be in a place remotely close to home or what they're used to and that those placements are often not successful because there's not a good match. And oftentimes they're not prepared to be within those environments, whether it's rural, whether it's tribal, whether it's a, um, uh, an incident uh, area. So that this is, again, uh, an area ripe for research, an area of that really should be um, focused on in terms of addressing, addressing disparities. When we look at, um, I want to go back just a little bit for patient provider satisfaction. We found that um, Cooper et al. Um, who's at Hop John Hopkins found that race concordant visits were longer and higher ratings of patient positive uh, effect than others. We also found that patients were more satisfied and rated um, their providers more participatory when there was race concordance. And there's a lot that's been done in our area of language concordance. When we look at mutual respect and shared decision making, again, um, the literature, um, there, there's just numerous findings. I think that as we um, think about that, that uh, Tucker and all found that patient perception of uh, behaviors uh, were associated with what they thought was culturally uh, sensitive care. And that included the doctor had to have good people skills, and that's in quotes, technical confidence, individualized treatment, and very effective communication. Um, and again, we also know that um, members of groups um, such as listed here, 14% of blacks, 9% of Hispanics, 20% of Asians, reported they've been treated with disrespect by their, by, their, by their doctor and what those implications are. Metzger et al., the work that we were engaged in with the Commonwealth Fund, also indicated without shared decision making and, and um, uh, that there's likely, not likely to be um, a lot of uh, mutual trust and respect within that provider patient. Um, uh, um, uh, relationship. And so as so we think about applying the cultural competence framework, and I'm just looking at this at the individual level, although we know that this applies very much to the systems level, um, let's look at what it means, acknowledging cultural difference. If we apply this to this, it really looks at, you have to recognize and accept differences in health beliefs, expectations of health care providers without judgment. Also being able to demonstrate valuing these differences in a manner of communication and medical decision making. As we think about this, again, this framework and applying to this and understanding your own culture, you must reflect upon your own cultural belief systems, including the culture of medicine. And oftentimes we think about culture as somebody else, um, as opposed to really looking at the impact of the cultural biomedicine. You have your own language, own points of view, your own values that are based on that field of study. And so, and how they influence interactions with patients, their families, healthcare staff with whom you work. As we look at engaged in self-assessment, we must be able to identify and respond to assessment tools, checklists that probe the values, behaviors, attitudes of family-centered care and culturally and linguistically competent care. And this is on an ongoing basis. Um, not a one-time basis, because things change over time. Um, and you must be able to really look at identifying and pursuing both formal and informal opportunities for learning about the impact of culture on health and mental health care. Um, also in the areas of disparities, culture-specific interventions, and culture-specific evidence-based practices. 
as we look at, um, again, um, acquiring cultural knowledge, it's being able to use assessment results to develop personal learning plans and goals and objectives that will be able to enhance your skills in this area, particularly as they relate to uh, addressing health and healthcare disparities. And lastly, um, we can look at um, being able to value diversity within your healthcare team and environment and reaching out to learn from members of your team and including your patient population um, in terms of cultural differences and experiences um, and perspectives, that, again, that may be different than your own. This is a way to begin to frame and to think about applying cultural competence to, to, these, um, to these general areas. It's much more detailed and complex than my summary. However, I think cultural linguistic competence is a journey and that we're all at various stages along, um, along that pathway. I'd like to end with a quote from Multnomah uh, Department of Health. Uh, they decided that they really needed to address cultural competence. They weren't doing as much as they needed to do um, as cultural competence. And it wasn't that they had such a racially or ethnically diverse population. They just didn't think they were serving all people well. And as she used to say as a culturally competent manager, when we asked permission to adopt this um, and to have a fill in the blank. So as I look at this and think about your roles and responsibilities, as a culturally competent, you fill in the blank. I'm capable of interacting positively with people who do not look like, talk like, move like, think like, believe like, act like, live like me. And I must say that um, I think it's quite eloquent. It sums things up really very quickly. And that the move like me was not there. We did this training in Department of Mental Health in Massachusetts in 2005, and an individual with a disability who was um, a staff member came up and said, I love this quote, but I don't see myself reflected. Would you mind modifying to say move like me, which I've done and um, have reported every time I use the slide since this time. So um, again, this is just a summary of the role of cultural linguistic competence um, in addressing disparities, and I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Truitt. I have two questions since uh, Ms. Goods come here that I've been asking myself. I guess I'd like to ask them of you as well as myself. Uh, and the questions I have are, where are we in the journey to cultural competence? And the second question will come to a little bit. So when I think about the health system, and I started to open the box and look in, I've actually found that we have several nuclei making major contributions to cultural change. The School of Medicine has a committee that is redoing the curriculum, and cultural competency is, as uh, Ms. Good said today, is not just a workshop in the curriculum. It's part of the fabric. It's going to be interwoven throughout the curriculum. I think that's a really big step forward for us, because we've been good about supplying knowledge, but no experiential, experiential uh, education. It's been just didactic. And I think there is a possibility that there's opportunity for change there. So I'm encouraged by that. The School of Nursing, I know that the dean is focusing, refocusing on diversity and cultural uh, competency, and there was a team there. And the Medical Center has actually done a fair amount in cultural competency, not only in our policies and the practices, uh, but in providing resources. And I'm also impressed that these three groups are within the community, whether it's the university community, the Central Virginia community, or even a larger community, has actually out, has reached out and interacted. Where I think that we're weakest, and I'm actually very excited that uh, Bernd Hawk is actually heading a committee, is we're the weakest in how these three circles actually interact in the middle. And I'm starting to see that there may be some movement there, that we could actually work together as three separate circles, not being separate. And you can tell my drawing had a little too much coffee. <laughs> So I actually went to the website because I said, well, what resources are out there? And so I, I actually asked you to ask yourself, have I been here and do I use this? So uh, John, there's, is there a mouse? This is my mouse too. Um, I can bring mine down for you. OK. 
Okay. Well, well, we'll make it. We'll see if I can get more involved. Yeah, uh, so, oh, you've got the mouse. Yes, where you uh, want to go. Oh, if you hit down language, thanks, Mark. So if you hit the language button up here in the top, the blue. <laughs> yeah, it's my fault. I'm not being very clear, right? Uh, you know, this language on the, the, on the hot one. Yeah. So when we look at language, we have CRCOM, uh, which uh, many of us utilize. We have uh, Spanish translators that can come to clinic or in-house. Thank you, John. Um, they can come in uh, to clinics, and I would say that in, in pediatrics, the top two languages uh, other than English are Spanish and Farsi. So we have translators here. Uh, we also have sign translators. So we actually have resources available to us. Um, we also can change our medications and to uh, translate them in. So Micromedics allows us to do this. I'm not saying we do. We have the resources available. Uh, we also have educational resources. And if you go to the web links here, there are tons of links in different languages to help translate and communicate. Um, and for cultural differences, there are uh, tons of links. And this is the Med Center page. But then if you go over here and hit cultural diversity, I'm stunned when I got here because I really haven't shopped here. And the library provides uh, country and cultural resources, patient education materials, and a variety of different links, easy to read materials, including kids' uh, cross-cultural competence in healthcare with links for cultural clues. So actually, we have lots of resources available to us. So I do think that we have resources available, and we actually have had education for residents, medical center staff, school of medicine staff, uh, students, school of nursing students. So we may have set the table to some extent, but have we changed and demonstrated that we've changed behavior and attitudes in our practice? And that's a question I think we have to ask ourselves. If the table has been set, and I think it can be set better than it's been set, but it has been set somewhat, have we actually taken advantage of what's been said? And to answer that question, you have to ask yourself as an institution, where are we on this continuum? I may have my bias where we are, and I will say, I learned very quickly yesterday that it's hard to have an institutional spot because there are so many ways to look at this that there'll be parts that are in one spot and in different spots. But if we were to try and summarize and put all of our uh, portions into one jar, where would, we, where would we be? And that's a question I would ask you to think about where we are and how can we get to the next level. So the other issue that uh, I wanted to talk about, um, and Preston set this up, was well, so do we have disparities in healthcare here at UVA? So the easiest data for me to get to was the inpatient data. So I apologize for those of you who practice in the outpatient arena, but I had to go where the data was easiest for me to get to. So I created an, a metric. This is not a real metric. I don't know what this metric means, but I knew when we charge people, and I said, well, how sick are they? And the CMI technically is a way of saying how sick you are. So if I took your charge and divided by CMI, I adjusted your charge. This is totally made up, OK? It's not in the literature anywhere that I'm aware of. So, well, I noticed that if we take this metric for what it's worth, we have actually a higher adjusted charge for males than females at the University of Virginia for discharges of 28,000 discharges last year. If we look at by age, that's no surprise to anybody here, if you're very young or you're much older, you have a higher charge for CMI than everybody else in between. If we do it by if you're indigent or not, well, it turns out if you're indigent, yes, the yes, the middle bar, you are less than the average. And if you're not an injured, you're slightly above the average in charges for CMI. So I looked at this a little bit closer and said this is a 5% difference. It's not the largest difference, but it's 5%. But the confidence intervals show that this is statistically different. So my question to you is, what does an indigent patient look like? How do we know who's indigent if we have these implicit biases? If I look at it by race, and these are the percent discharges at the University of Virginia last year, 76% were Caucasian American, Hispanic American, 4%, African American, 18%, um, Asian American, 0.5%. Uh, 
and Native American, uh, very small. So if I, because Native American is so small, let's just look to the uh, bar, bars on the right. The green bars are indigent. The blue bars are non-indigent. And it really isn't by race. Because every uh, race has indigent charges per Kesmix uh, index lower. Now, I don't know this is a real metric. I don't know if this is a difference or a difference in the way we practice or if it's not really a difference. But it does raise some questions that I think we should look into ourselves and how we deliver our care. So those are the two questions I've had for you that I tried to pose for you to think about. Where are we and do we provide uh, non-disparate health care? I don't know if I need it. Uh, first of all, thank, uh, thank you to the uh, Center on uh, Biomedical Ethics and the Medical Humanities for inviting me to participate in the program. And I really appreciate the comments of the prior speakers. Um, Dr. Good offered us some really compelling evidence, I think, that dealing with cultural competency, becoming more proficient uh, culturally can help us in our goal of trying to reduce, if not to eliminate, uh, health disparities. Uh, Dr. Reynolds talked some about um, the history of racial oppression in this country and how that discrimination has led not only to poorer health, but to um, um, lasting effects in the healthcare professions. Um, and Dr. Chua talked about very specifically what's going on here at the UVA health system and some ways in which um, uh, this may have affected the care that we provide uh, here at UVA. I want to take about five minutes or so and talk about one uh, specific thing, which is racial stereotyping and bias. Uh, Dr. Good, in her comments, uh, pointed out that the uh, existence of health inequities has uh, myriad causes uh, that are uh, very uh, systemic, structural, social, environmental, all kinds of uh, uh, issues are involved in um, uh, creating and maintaining these health inequities. Uh, and I think that probably that accounts for the majority of the health inequities that we see. But if, say, 60 to 70 percent of the, uh, and I'm going to talk about racial and ethnic health disparities, if 60 to 70 percent of those inequities are the result of those kinds of social inequities, the, much of the remaining 30 to the 40 percent, I believe, can be attributed to uh, provider uh, issues. Some of which, uh, again, Dr. Um, uh, Reynolds and Ms. Good pointed to in talking about things like um, racial stereotyping and, and bias. Uh, cultural differences uh, and lack of cultural competency when thought in uh, broad terms. I wanted to pick on just this one aspect of racial uh, stereotyping and bias, um, which I believe uh, has a major impact on what we do as healthcare providers. And to be fair to healthcare providers, this is not just a problem with healthcare providers. It runs very deep in U.S. society. You all, of course, will recall the natural and social disaster of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, one of the things that uh, was very striking in, in during the uh, coverage, the new media coverage of Hurricane Katrina, was the bias of the uh, news reporting. Uh, this is two press reports. The first one here, uh, the AP uh, report, comes. Um, it's, April, it's August 30th. It's a picture of a young um, black male. The, uh, the story begins, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans, blah, blah, blah. Second report, two whites. Two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. It hasn't changed much in the uh, five years since that time. Uh, in the recent uh, events in Haiti, we have once again seen the same sort of uh, biased reporting. Uh, 
hours practically after the earthquake, we start getting reports of looting in Port-au-Prince. Um, but I maintain, you know, we should ask ourselves, is this looting? Or people trying to find food after being, you know, devastated by uh, earthquake and no longer having food, shelter, or water. They're not stealing, they're trying to stay alive. This is a problem that it permeates our society. These implicit, and, and by implicit I mean unconscious biases that we have toward people of color. It's something that uh, permeates the, our society all the way from the lower rungs up to the uh, halls of Congress. About a month ago, you will recall, uh, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, uh, there was a big hoopla. A book came out, Game Change. In Game Change, uh, Reid is quoted uh, as saying in 2008 that Barack Obama should run for president because he was light-skinned and didn't talk black. Harry Reid caught a lot of flack for using the word Negro. And as in words go, I have to say this one's pretty innocuous. Uh, what, what really uh, concerns me about his comment is not the use of that word. What concerns me is that it points to the fact that there, and he's, and he's pointing to, a very widespread uh, racial stereotype and bias among white voters, and even worse, saying that we should pander to it. Someone else was quoted in Game Change. You all, did you all catch that? They buried this one. Bill Clinton, former president, is quoted in, uh, in, in his comments regarding the uh, possible Obama candidacy were these. Now, perhaps this is Bill Clinton. He was good at vague statements. Um, so, so this, this statement is vague enough that it could be read a number of different ways. I heard it and I thought this is a very uh, mean-spirited, racially biased comment uh, about the role of African Americans and other people uh, in U.S. government. Other people who wanted to cut Bill some slack said, no, 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 no. And what he's really referring to is Obama's age and supposed lack of government experience. Either way, it's bias. Either way, he's evidencing the fact that he thinks that either because the guy's black or because the guy's younger than he is, there's no way that he's capable of um, being president. And that kind of biased thinking is something that, again, is very, very rampant. One of the things that Ms. Good said in her comments was that uh, part of our journey toward cultural competency and proficiency is doing a thoroughgoing self-assessment, learning about our own uh, culture of origin, understanding that, learning about the cultures of others that we uh, attempt to serve, and doing a thoroughgoing self-assessment, I think, means uh, taking advantage of things like uh, the tools provided by the National Center on cultural competency that she directs at Georgetown. And you should definitely go to their site and look at some of the things that, and resources that they provide. Uh, and I also think another way to do it is um, to, through exploring a tool that is also readily available on the internet, uh, which is a, a psychometric instrument known as the Implicit Association Test. The IAT um, can be accessed through this uh, website, Project Implicit. Uh, and on this website, you can find more than 90 IATs where you can assess your conscious and unconscious biases on anything from pets to politics to body habitus, money, uh, sex, race, you name it. You can go and find out whether or not uh, you have any biases that you weren't necessarily aware of. This, this website is housed at, on a server at Harvard. However, the person who maintains this website is one of our own. Uh, Dr. Brian Nozick is an associate professor of psychology here at UVA. 
uh, and is a world-renowned expert on implicit cognition and its impact on human um, behavior. Uh, Dr. Nozick and I recently got funded by the NIH to do a study utilizing the IAT to look at the impact of racial stereotyping and bias on uh, the delivery of clinical services. And we're, we're uh, in the process of recruiting study uh, participants right now, and hopefully uh, this and some other projects that we are looking into will uh, provide some more data about the impact of implicit bias on clinical services. One of the most important, and I believe exciting aspects of the work that we're doing is trying to use the IAT not just to identify and describe implicit biases and how they impact uh, clinical services, but use it as a tool to help providers manage or eliminate those biases. And I'll end on, on this note. Uh, I think most of us, I don't think that, I, I firmly believe and, 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 and think that this is a fact, that in the United States today, conscious uh, racism is, is a vanishingly small uh, phenomenon. Um, most people are what the social psych uh, psychologists would call adverse of racists. Right? Um, if Marcia says something to me and, and I find it offensive racially and I tell that to her, her, her response to that would be, oh my god, I didn't realize that. Thank you for telling me. I will look into making sure I don't do that again because that's horrible. Um, we think by using instruments like the IAT, you can help healthcare providers recognize formerly unconscious biases, make them conscious, and because consciously they oppose these sorts of things, they will then use that information to change their behavior, which I would agree is where we all want to go with this. Cultural competency uh, includes changing our attitudes, but also changing our behaviors, and by doing so, uh, will lead to redu reductions in um, health inequities. Thank you. Thank you to all four of our speakers, and we've um, left a generous amount of time for your comments and questions, so that I hope we have time to really start a good and constructive conversation about what we've heard today and what you've been thinking about Several of the speakers have posed questions for each of us to think about and questions for our institution to think about. So um, I will come around with the mic and take your comments and questions. So who would like to start? Okay, if you can wait for me to bring you the mic so that you're on the table. And I'll ask you to identify yourself, please, when you ask your question. Hi, I'm Jason Ellis. I'm a first year med school student. So we're talking about becoming more culturally competent. What resources as physicians or med school students are out there so we can learn about other cultures we may have never heard about or that we may encounter in our practice? You want to turn your mic on? Thank you for your question. Um, there are a wealth of resources that uh, would be available um, on numerous websites, um, including our own, and obviously what Dr. Truitt said here at, um, at the University of Virginia. I, I think um, while it's very important, the approach that UVA is currently doing in terms of integrating this into your curriculum is the most appropriate way to go. Because while you go about trying to acquire this knowledge on your own, it still needs to be within um, a structured context in which you would be able to apply it. Also, I'd like to say that while a lot of times people think you need to go to a book to learn about these things or a website, that actually patients and their families and communities are excellent sources of information about their own health beliefs and practices. And that we should not overlook that as a critical um, source of information in terms of uh, enhancing our, our knowledge 
around a variety of cultural uh, groups, race, and ethnicity. Would any of the other speakers like to respond also? Is there anyone here from the curriculum committee? Because uh, one of the things that's going to happen in the, in the curriculum as it's being redesigned is to integrate uh, uh, questions of uh, cultural competency throughout the curriculum. And uh, as we move toward trying to make the curriculum more problem-based and uh, uh, bring clinical experience into the earlier years in, in the med medical school education, one of the ways that that comes up is but one of the things that you can do in that context is talk about cultural competency. You know, you can use real examples. You know, someone brings in uh, uh, an Asian youth into the emergency room who has an upper respiratory in, uh, infection um, and has all these uh, apparent, uh, you know, first degree burn marks all over their back. Have you ever seen that? Okay. Um, when when I first saw something like that in the emergency room and it was a hamam. Uh, child, I was ready to call child protection services because it looked like the kid had been brutalized. But in fact, in a number of uh, Asian um, communities, coining, they call it, is a, is a um, technique that's used to treat upper respiratory uh, infections. So you could talk about that sort of thing in the context of talking about dealing with a real patient in a real situation. The goal is for each new system as it gets built out across the curriculum to have cultural competency embedded as a set of case vignettes and that for each clinical rotation students will be assessed on their clinical cultural competence skills and then there will probably be advanced electives to take as a fourth year student. So it's going to be longitudinally built throughout the curriculum both in the basic science years and in the clinical rotations, and then in the course electives. And I would add, in addition to that on the website, there's a book by Maurice Apre, who is a faculty member here, that actually, they're all little vignettes. They're almost two pages, maybe three. They're very quick, but they're pointy. They make a point about certain aspects and a variety of different cultures, and so that you would see a patient, such as Norm described, and you would hear what some of the take-home messages might be for you. Um, sorry. I was wondering, um, is it not, oh, I'm Alex, and I'm Alex Smith, I'm a first year medical student as well. Um, so I was wondering, as, as far as physicians and patient interaction, um, is it also not so much just being culturally competent, but then the idea again about attitude, about um, when you're talking to someone, you don't treat them, because I feel like you can be culturally competent in the sense that you may know a lot, technically about, or you think you do, about someone because of their ethnicity or their culture, but you still come off to them like a little bit less friendly because they're not like, to you, they don't look like you, they're not like you. So you might be like, oh, I know you like to coin and stuff like that, but blah, 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 but you still kind of have that attitude. Whereas um, maybe it's just as effective that even if you don't completely know about someone's culture, you're treating them like, like, as if they are your family. Well, not like your family group. My like, point is, like, like you, I guess, in a sense, or not like this foreign person. I, I guess, from my perspective, from hearing you say, I, I think the approach of using inquiry when you're talking to your patient is a lot better than talking to your patient with your agenda. So if you ask them questions, you'll learn more and than just providing them. As if, like, just treating them like you would treat your neighbor who came to the to a doctor's appointment, you know, not treating them like, oh, you just immigrated here, or even if you've been here your whole life, you're from a different part of town or a different socioeconomic status, but just treating them like you're talking to someone else that you consider to be your equal. You know, more so than focusing on always knowing each different ethnicity who comes in, like what you are, just treating them equally, too. And the other stuff will maybe come as you get to know them more. So I would ask a question, what does treating them equally mean? And I, you don't have to answer. Um, I'm just, just just throwing that out there, uh, because um, as we we think about treating someone like your neighbor, well, my neighbor may be one way, someone else's neighbor may be something else. So that I think what cultural compass is is really saying is that we approach each person as an individual. We don't assume because of someone's race, ethnicity, gender, status, or class that we know something about them, and that there should be a process of inquiry. Um, 
to elicit the kind of information you need to know in order to serve patients well. I think what I hear you say um, may come from the literature of a colleague, who's Melody Turbulon, um, around cultural humility. She wrote a wonderful piece that looks at cultural humility because it was specifically directed toward physicians, okay, for physicians to say that one needs to be humble, that we can learn from our patients, and that our growth is continual in this area. So I suggest if you just Google cultural humility and read that article, I think it may be synonymous with what you're sharing today. But I think that we can't um, quickly sum up what cultural competence is just in an encounter. Because again, as I stated, that cultural competence means not only what uh, Preston does, it means the capacity of an organization to support you with policies, procedures, resources, um, uh, and, and practices that will enable you to, quote, have a home for culturally competent care. Hi, my name is Buki Awozba. I'm a fourth year um, undergraduate student in the college. And um, my question is, in light of the statute that allows physicians to refuse to see a patient, how do you think that that affects their cultural competency, and do you think there should be guidelines initiated? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, uh, so first of all, the, the statute says if it's an emergency, then you cannot refuse. So that, uh, at least for that portion, um, I think it's a problem. I think that if you have the uh, right to refuse a patient based on uh, any reason, uh, it does direct the care uh, and it creates a wedge in the distribution of care. So I would say that it's a problem for us. Uh, the way that it's it practiced or written as it is. I'm, I don't have a good answer, a good solution for uh, how to make that change. I'm, I'm open. I, I will add historically that when President Johnson implemented Medicare, it was an absolute commitment to do it across sites, across professions, so that if a physician was seeing a minority patient in their office or in a hospital clinic, or on a hospital ward, that there would be no denial of services based on race, gender, or country of origin. Organized medicine refused to support Medicare unless that provision was deleted. And so when they implemented Medicare, they were only limited to implementing it within the hospital setting. So unfortunately, for the last 40 years, the physician community has been able to control its private practice and clinic environment and deny services to certain populations of patients. We've come to the end of our time, and I'm going to let her have the last word. That was wonderful that all of us should be curious and um, enjoy the multicultural experience that we have here in Charlottesville and at UVA, and approaching it with a certain amount of humility and, and interest um, to, to know more about the world that's all around us. I'd like you to join me in thanking our four panelists.